Good morning, Cypress Creek. It looks like at least a few of you changed your clocks. I'm afraid some others may not have. We're glad that you're here. It's always a gift for me to be able to welcome each and every one of you to this church where we strive to put love first in all things and where we promise to share living waters with you as best we can. We have a couple of other announcements, which requires glasses. Uh, our bunny truck hop and candy giveaway for as many kids as we can get through these doors takes place on April the 7th. We expect lots of families, lots of kids on the property, so please come join us and please come help us. We are in need of candy to fill the eggs and eggs to hold the candy, so if you want to help, please do. Bruce is going to start two new classes on March 23rd and the 30th. They will take place at 1.30 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. And it's going to be on a study called The Cross of Jesus, Living Waters. So, will you join me in the scripture reading this morning? It comes from John chapter 4, verses 6 through 30. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? Jews do not usually share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, 
Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him and must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, will he proclaim all things to us? Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then, when, then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Bless you. Come on, 
morning. It's lovely to be with you all this morning. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Mariah Newell. I'm one of the ministers here on staff, and I am delighted to be able to bring some good news today. If we have any young disciples, children, they can go with Miss Jennifer in the back to our children's time. And while they're heading out, it's just lovely. It's just lovely seeing all your faces. I'm normally going with them. <laughs> I don't like cheese. I know some folks can't live without it, but honestly, I've never had a taste for it. I'm somewhat lactose intolerant, and that by that I mean I'm lactose intolerant, but I make an exception for pizza and ice cream. <laughs> I miss milk, um, but even if my stomach could handle cheese, uh, my taste buds can't. And it's something I don't bring up first in conversation when I was younger. I actually hated when someone brought it up for me because it's a conversation derailer. What? You don't like cheese? Like all cheese. What, what about pizza or queso? Then there's the always joking, you know, I don't know if we can be friends after this. I wonder if that's how the Samaritan woman felt when she named, I don't have a husband, to Jesus. She, like myself in my cheese confession, probably knew all the questions and the comments that were going to come next. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, why not? Oh, you were, you were married before, what happened? How many times? And you live with who now? Pretty effective conversation derailer. And the, yeah, I don't know if we can be friends, was probably a bit more serious than the one that I hear. Let's pause here and name. No one knows what this fact of five husbands and another man at home that she's not married to actually means. We're all guessing why this fact was added. We can look at the norms of the time and make our best assertions. She didn't have the power to divorce anyone, so she may have been left by five different men. All five of them could have died while married to her, and there was a custom that if a woman was widowed, and another member, then another member of her husband's family would marry her. So maybe all five brothers passed away, and the sixth didn't really want to die too. People were pretty superstitious at the time. Or hey, you know, maybe she poisoned them all. We truly don't know. But I do believe, because it's added, that it's important. It's important because it seems to give one interpretation on why she came to the well alone at noon. It wasn't typical practice. Women came to wells in the morning in a group. It was a safety, a practicality, and a community event. It seemed very probable that whatever the circumstance it was that led her to having five different husbands and a sixth man that she was living with, that the community deemed something of that situation and her unworthy. My heart actually breaks for this woman every time I encounter this text. I can almost hear the, well, you know, we would love for you to come with us in the mornings, but, well, you know, some people are kind of uncomfortable with your history, and we don't want to divide the group. And, you know, I'm okay with the fact that you've had five husbands, but not everybody is. And, well, we want some of the other wives to come with us, and their husbands just don't feel right about it. And, and you know, you understand, right? I know what those statements sound like because I have unfortunately said them. When I was in college, I was part of a friend group, and we were a group of six, and we turned into a group of five. One of my friends at the time came to us and said, don't be friends with her anymore. Like I said, I was in college, I was not young, and I should have known better, but I didn't. I had those horrible conversations with someone I considered and who considered me as a friend. I stopped being friends with someone because of someone else's reasoning on why they did not deserve to be in our friend group anymore. And I'm also very ashamed to say that I don't remember what the reason or the reasons actually were. I just knew at the time I would lose all of my friends 
to stand with the one. So in this story, I'm one of the women who shamed the Samaritan woman. Maybe I wasn't the instigator, but I sure went along with actively not including her. And when I read biblical stories, I always want to read myself into the good role, you know, but to do so would be dishonest to who I've been and show no growth in who I hope I've become. For the Samaritan woman, I'm actually going to go a step further and say that the community found an excuse to exclude this woman potentially in the name of God because they thought it was the right thing to do based on her history. They thought it would be something God would understand or condone being done. The conversation is theologically steeped. She is obviously a woman of faith. She knows the main difference between a Samaritan and a Jew is the location of the temple. She recognizes Jesus as a prophet. She knows the Messiah is coming. She is rooted in her faith. She is not outside of the community based on any lack of faith. And then she can't seem to catch a break on the outside of the community either. The disciples come back and they were astonished, surprised, shocked, depending on which translation you read. And that was just for being a Samaritan and a woman. And that Jesus was speaking to her like an equal. I mean, imagine if they knew about the husbands. But instead of meeting any of the judgmental faces that surrounded her in her community, or any of the judgmental faces she knew she would meet in strangers, she met Jesus, who offered her living water, who heard her derailer and responded in a way that said, I know, I've known this whole time. I see you and I accept you exactly as you are. He never condemns her. He never forgives her. He frees her of believing ever again. You don't belong here, but you understand, right? On Sunday mornings in the youth group, every now and then, we do something called donuts and deep thoughts. I bring donuts, and I ask questions. I pull out a, this box that was gifted to the youth group, and we talk about our answers to the question. One day, the question was, out of everything, what do you feel people need most in the world? Someone said food. Another said clothes. Another said water. And then one young, wise young woman said, I think acceptance is what people need most. What if that's the living water? We can find every excuse in the world for exclusion, and we can often find a way to put God's name on it. But as my former band director would say, excuses are like armpits. We all have two, and they both stink. <laughs> When we look at the life and the actions of Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior bringing living water, bringing acceptance to those pushed to the edge of the community, I believe we have a hard time believing we're called to anything but the radical inclusion of all that astonishes, surprises, and even shocks those around us. And I don't think we have to be comfortable in the process. The disciples certainly weren't. The disciples, the folks who claim to know Jesus, is the Messiah, the living God. They often tell Jesus, uh, you know you can't do that, right? <laughs> Jesus starts healing, starts talking, mingling, breaking rules, even talks about his death, and the disciples are really uncomfortable. Jesus always does what he's doing anyways. But I'm really grateful for a Jesus that gave the disciples living water in their discomfort, too, that showed the honest responses, because if I was a disciple, I would be really uncomfortable, too. Following the life of Jesus is not easy, and that living water sometimes feels like an extreme whitewater rafting adventure where you can't see anything, but you have no idea where you're going, and you're bouncing off rocks, hoping that the raft doesn't pop, and Jesus is like, trust me, it's all going to be fine. But the funny thing is, is that when we read through these scriptures, we often don't notice the disciples being uncomfortable. And we don't talk about their discomfort as much because we always get to read to the end of the story. And we see how the living water that is Jesus Christ rushes over the entire situation and ultimately saves. At Ash Wednesday, I talked about de-haunting our faith. And this is one of the places that I feel can sometimes be haunted because it's written all over the disciples' face. 
We didn't think that she could be part of us. Are you really sure? I have a friend who is a pastor in Illinois, and he told me something that happened to him one summer a few years ago at a camp he counsels. They start their camp with a tradition of a cleansing. It's not a baptism, but it is a reminder of their baptism, where they get everyone in the pool, and they take a bucket of water, and they pour it over the campers' heads one by one, and as the water rushes over them, they say, you are a beloved child of God. He had a camper that year who was non-binary and who had never been to summer camp before. Their pastor had come with them, and he said that as this youth was going through camp, they were having the time of their life. They were brought into every camp friend group. They were quickly and dearly loved. One day during some of the water games, my friend noticed the youth had fresh cuts on their arm. My friend pulled the camper aside and alerted everyone that it was a professional that needed to know. And with another adult, he asked, hey, are these new? What's going on? You seem so happy here. The camper looked at him and said, I am happy here. I've never been to a place like this before where I'm not picked on or made fun of. Every day is hard, but it's not hard here. I'm just having a hard time believing that this kind of love can be real. I want to come back. I know I've messed up. I can't believe I've messed this up. Can I please come back? My pastor friend told me honestly he was not comfortable. The other parents that found out there was a non-binary camper after camp were not comfortable, but he prayed and he had so many conversations over the next few months and the camper came back and stayed. The camper no longer self-harms, they're graduating this year, none were condemned and none needed to be forgiven, all were washed by the living water and reminded again and again, I know you, I see you, I love you just as you are. May we be astonished, may we be surprised, may we be shocked, and may we go and do likewise. Will you join me in a word of prayer? God, who is love, we know love is patient and love is kind. May we be patient in listening to you and how you call us deeper into love. May we be kind to ourselves in the journey. May we be patient when we feel pushed to the margins that we know your living water will reach us because you seek us out and you have not left us abandoned. May we be kind to ourselves, keep ourselves whole when we feel we are the only ones holding ourselves together. May you be patient. May you be kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. You are love, and it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> to the table today, I have a poetry reading, actually, for you. Um, this is uh, by Reverend Melissa Hinnon. Uh, she works with Sanctified Art, and this is a hundred-word sermon, is what it's titled, uh, about this passage of the woman at the well that I felt was appropriate for coming to the table today. Neighbors glare, ostracize, and deplete, more oppressive than a midday sun. Thirsty sojourners arrive at the well, hearts hardened by life, jugs ready to be filled. Beckoned by ancestors to a common ground, a stranger waits and asks for a drink. He knows every hope and every fear without judgment. He sees into every soul, revealing his truth. I am he. Joy bubbles up. Sacred longing is quenched by a life-giving spirit spring. Drop everything, tell everyone, share the good news. Neighbors who recoiled are redeemed and reconciled. A town is transformed by a woman who declares, Christ is here, come and meet him. Neighbors glares, ostracized and deplete, more 
Christ is here, come and meet him. I apologize, that was the wrong song. We come to the table today. Christ is here, come and meet him. And we said,
Jesus took a cup filled with wine and said, This cup and the contents represent my blood, the life of me that I give to you and the world. As often as we share in this meal, we are remembering and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you thirsty, and you invite us to drink. When we have received living water to quench our thirst, Jesus says that love will flow from our hearts into the life of the world. Lord, we know that you are the giver of life, and we pray that our lives will be filled and overflowing with the power of your love, so we can make a difference in this world and bring honor to your name, Lord. We ask for your help in reminding us that the most important things are not what we do outwardly, not based on talent or gifts, but the most significant thing we can do in this life is simply to love you and to choose to love others. Fill us with your spirit so we can choose what is best. We are weak, Lord, but you are strong within us. Thank you that you equip us to face each day with the power of your love, your forgiveness, and your grace. Hear us now as we prepare to share this meal and receive your living water by praying the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. some clothes you know maybe you can run home come back we've got sandwiches and it should be a good day of fellowship and some nice
nice hard work. Um, another thing is we have a wonderful Girl Scout troop here today. Uh, they are from Scout Troop 111146. Many ones. Um, and our craft crowd has their boutiques open today. So I hope uh, that you are able to shop both of these places, cookies and crafts, what can go wrong. We are going to join together in our call to discipleship. This is the point in time in our worship. If you would like to join your life to the life of Christ and to this community, please feel welcome to come forward and do that during this song. Or meet with one of the pastors, myself, or our elders at the close.